Thank you very much, Sarah. And good afternoon and welcome to the AUA's Interstitial Cystitis Bladder Pain Syndrome Current Diagnosis and Management Future Trends webinar. I'd like to uh, welcome our uh, faculty here. We have uh, Quentin Clemens from uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Sander Lovash from Budapest, Hungary, where it's 11 o'clock this evening. And I'm happy to have both of them uh, helping me with this program. As Sarah mentioned, we hope that you will actively engage with, with us throughout the program. Please interact with us and feel free to ask questions at any point during the uh, GoToWebinar using the question box on your screen. So we'll go ahead. This is the plan for today. I'll be starting out the presentations. Then uh, Dr. Lovash will speak, and finally, Dr. Clemens will conclude the uh, program uh, later in the 90-minute uh, presentation. So let's start with definition, nomenclature, and diagnosis. What are we really uh, talking about here? Well, Guy Hunter, who was a gynecologist at Johns Hopkins, was the person who popularized the diagnosis of interstitial cystitis and brought it out into the mainstream. And he defined it as a peculiar form of bladder ulceration whose diagnosis depends ultimately on its resistance to all ordinary forms of treatment in patients with frequency and bladder symptoms or spasms. And that's a little bit over 100 years ago today, but it's important to keep in mind. Things changed subsequently, and in 1949, J.R. Hand wrote a famous paper describing small, discrete submucosal hemorrhages and dot-like bleeding points in these patients. And these were coined glomerulations by Anthony Walsh from Ireland in the Campbell's Urology published in 1978. Subsequently, in a very important paper, which uh, was for the next 30 years extremely influential, uh, Messing and uh, Tom Stamey, Ed Messing and Tom Stamey, changed the definition of interstitial cystitis into nonspecific and highly subjective symptoms of around the clock frequency urgency and pain, somewhat relieved by voiding when associated with glomerulations upon bladder distension under anesthesia. So you could have either a hunter lesion or glomerulations and the symptoms, and that made the diagnosis. So it became more of a diagnosis of exclusion. And this paper led us to some extent on the wrong path for the next 30, 35 years. Uh, and it's only recently we've come to realize that. So after the publication of that paper, things became a little bit confused. Uh, Vicki Ratner, who was a orthopedics resident in New York, developed symptoms of this disease. And she went all over the country to try and get a diagnosis, ended up seeing Tom Stamey, and was diagnosed with interstitial cystitis. And that led her to begin the Interstitial Cystitis Association, the first patient organization for this disease and a very uh, influential organization over time. And I appeared with her twice in the fall of 1986 on Good Morning America for short segments of about six minutes. And after the first six minute segment that we did, which was in September, they received 10,000 letters from patients saying, finally, there's something, there's a diagnosis for what I have. And people started to realize that this was not the rare disease that Hunter had described in 1915, but a much more common problem. So the NIH took note of this, and in 1987, held a workshop on interstitial cystitis, inviting urologists and gynecologists from Europe, Scandinavia, the United States, and Canada to Washington. And we held a meeting there and defined what were called the NIDDK criteria. And these were criteria to define research parameters of interstitial cystitis so that clinical and basic research findings would have a common basis for comparison. They were not meant to be a de facto definition for the clinician. There was no requirement for pain in the NIDDK criteria. But because of the void, at that point, they sort of did become a de facto definition, was, which proved to be uh, a major problem. 
That same year, Magnus Fall published a very important paper, Chronic Interstitial Cystitis, a Heterogeneous Syndrome. He was at the meeting in 1987. He's from Gothenburg, Sweden. And what he said was ignored for the next three decades. He said Hunter lesion disease should not be evaluated with non-Hunter disease in clinical studies, that this was, in essence, a different problem altogether. But people didn't really pay attention to that. The NIDDK then put a lot of money into research looking at interstitial cystitis. The first five years were the interstitial cystitis database to gather information. The next 10 years were a search for a magic bullet to treat this disease. And then finally, in 2008, they went back to basics with the multidisciplinary approach to the study of chronic pelvic pain, or the MAP program, which we'll hear more about later from uh, Quentin. And here they sought a broader input from pain specialists, rheumatologists, gastroenterologists, and clinical and basic scientists. Now, the, one of the big things that came out of the database in the first five years of the NIDDK funding was to look at the NIDDK criteria. Did they do what they were supposed to do? And yes, the findings showed that they did. Of patients who met the NIDDK criteria, 90% were agreed upon by physicians from all over the world, really, to have interstitial cystitis. However, they could not be used clinically. And the reason I say that is because of patients diagnosed with interstitial cystitis by clinical experts, 60% did not fulfill the NIDDK criteria. So it was apparent that we were missing a lot of patients, especially in areas of the world where they were using the NIDDK criteria as definitive for making a diagnosis. The AUA became involved around 2005 and set up a guideline committee and in 2008, they published the first AUA guideline on interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome, defining it as an unpleasant sensation, pain, pressure, or discomfort perceived to be related to the urinary bladder associated with lower urinary tract symptoms of more than six weeks duration in the absence of infection or other identifiable causes. There was no requirement for Hunter lesion or glomerulation, so this was purely a symptom-driven syndrome. And this, in a way, this made it relatively simple, even though it appears complex. If you fit the uh, diagnosis, or the, rather the definition of interstitial cystitis, then you had the disease. The diagnosis was one of exclusion in patients who met the definition. <clears throat> Confusable diseases as the cause of symptoms must be excluded. Further documentation and classification of bladder pain syndrome might be performed according to findings at cystoscopy and morphological findings in bladder biopsies, and the presence of other organ symptoms as well as cognitive, behavioral, emotional, and sexual symptoms should be addressed. So you have a whole list of confusable diseases, and how do you narrow this down to interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome? Well, start out with a history, the duration of symptoms, a negative urine culture, the number of voids per day, the location, character, and severity of pain, pressure, or discomfort, and look for dyspareunia, dysuria, ejaculatory pain in men, and the relationship of pain to menstruation in women. You want to check an O'Leary SANT symptom and problem index score because you can use this to follow patients and their response to treatment over time. And then a Visual analog scale for pain or a numerical rating scale for pain is also very helpful. In terms of examination, abdominal and pelvic examination focusing on areas of tenderness and trigger points, the pelvic support should be documented, a focused evaluation to rule out vaginitis, urethritis, tender prostate and urethral diverticulum, all potentially confusable diseases, a brief neurological examination, an ultrasound post void residual, and then a urine and urinalysis and urine culture to make sure you're not dealing with an infection. Cystoscopy and urodynamic testing are considered optional prior to initiating therapy unless the diagnosis is in doubt. 
However, more and more, it's been realized that cystoscopy is critical to identify a Hunter lesion and probably should move up in the diagnostic algorithm, especially since now you can identify a Hunter lesion under local anesthesia in the office. So doing these simple studies, you leave bladder pain syndrome as the diagnosis of exclusion. It turns out it's not quite so easy. Myofascial pelvic pain can be primary or secondary to perceived bladder pain. Overactive bladder can be difficult to differentiate. And there are a subset of overactive bladder patients that have pain in and or outside the pelvis. Urodynamics may be helpful in this situation. And the key question that I ask all of my patients is how would you feel if there were no toilet available? If they tell me they would be primarily feeling a lot of pain or pressure or discomfort, it's more likely to indicate interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome. If it's more that they are afraid they're going to wet themselves and they have to cross their legs, then I think more of overactive bladder. This brings us to phenotyping ICBPS and the quandary that the current uh, FDA draft guidelines have left us in. Regardless of what we call it or how we define it, phenotyping may hold the key to improving treatment outcomes and facilitating research. The only time-tested phenotype in 2020 is the Hunter lesion, which defined the disease 100 years ago. There are only a few anecdotal examples of a non-Hunter lesion patient assuming this phenotype, and the patient population seems to be very different than the non-Hunter lesion patient. Histologically, Hunter lesion disease is more of an inflammatory disorder. Inflammation is prominent. There's epithelial denudation and the pancystitis. Non-Hunter lesion disease may be non-inflammatory in, in many cases. Inflammation can be scarce. Epithelium is preserved. And uh, histologically, it appears very different than Hunter lesion disease. The mean age of onset of Hunter lesion disease is 41 to 55 years versus 30 to 42 years in non-Hunter patients. The response to cyclosporin is up to 85% with the Hunter lesion and less than 30% in the non-Hunter lesion population. Hunter lesions respond to fulguration, resection, or steroid installation. They have a rather distinct pathology, non-Hunter lesion disease, may appear normal in almost 50% or more of cases. There are fewer comorbid conditions in patients with Hunter lesion disease, more comorbid conditions in those without Hunter lesion, and Dr. Clements will discuss this later. There's a lower anatomic bladder capacity in patients with a Hunter lesion and a larger anatomic bladder capacity. That's capacity under sedation in patients with non-Hunter lesion disease. Uh, certainly, functional capacity can be limited in both of these groups. So what we've seen happen is we've gone in a big circle. In 1915, Hunter lesion defined interstitial cystitis. In 1978, we added glomerulations in the paper by Messing and Stamey. And then in 2011, we, dis we threw out both of those uh, cystoscopic findings and made it a purely symptomatic definition, as is evident in the AUA guideline. And now in 2019, we see that Hunter lesion disease may really be a disease of itself, back to what it was considered back in 1915 by Guy Hunter. And we now know that glomerulations have very little, if any, significance when used clinically, despite the fact they make very nice looking pictures. So in, 19, in 2017, the Sixth International Consultation on Incontinence actually pulled Hunter lesion out of bladder pain syndrome and made it a separate disorder or disease in and of itself. And since then, uh, many others have considered it in the same way. In Beaumont, uh, Michigan, uh, Ken Peters' group says we believe Hunter lesion IC is a distinct disease from non-Hunter IC, and therapy should focus on the bladder. In Japan, more and more papers are coming out suggesting that ICBPS with Hunter lesion be referred to separately from bladder pain syndrome. 
Uh, Magnus Fall, who wrote that famous paper in 1987 that was ignored for three decades, has a new paper in the Scandinavian Journal of Urology this uh, year saying that it's time to accept that classic IC with Hunter lesions and BPS always should be evaluated separately in science as well as in clinical routine, and that's from the ESSEC group. And the new Asian guideline, which was just published a month ago, also uh, looks at Hunter lesion disease as a completely different entity. Now, how common is a Hunter lesion? Well, we used to think it was incredibly rare, but putting all of the studies that have been published together, <clears throat> Rob Moldwin in the new Campbell's chapter showed that 34% of patients who have been looked at have a Hunter lesion. Now, this number is much higher in Scandinavia and Europe than in the United States, where it may be as low as 10 to 20% and up to 50% in Europe. But nevertheless, if you look for Hunter lesions, you'll often find them. And it's now pretty much agreed that you can spot the majority of Hunter lesions doing a cystoscopy under local. At present, there is no biomarker with high selectivity and sensitivity suitable for the differential diagnosis of BPSIC from other diseases. Why is this? Well, perhaps because of heterogeneity of the underlying mechanisms of bladder pain syndrome or variability in the diagnostic criteria. We don't really know. The FDA published a draft guideline for guiding the pharmaceutical industry to establish effectiveness of drugs for treatment. And this came out in December. It's not definitive yet, and they're taking comments on it, and it'll probably come out in a definitive fashion later this year. But in my estimation, it was very problematic for the following reasons. Number one, they noted that clinical trials should not exclude patients based on the description of their symptoms. Well, if you're not going to phenotype patients by symptoms or other means, then you're not going to make progress. It's been since 1996 when Elmeron was approved that we've had a new drug for this disease approved by FDA. <clears throat> so I, I don't think we should you know, block the effort to phenotype these patients for clinical trials. Second, ideally, treatments intended for ICBPS should improve both the bladder pain, discomfort, and lower urinary tract symptoms. Well, I would disagree with the FDA, and I would, I would submit that uh, these uh, goals should be either or. You, don't, you shouldn't have to accomplish both to have a drug that's worth, worthy for treatment. Third, randomized controlled trials should last at least six months. That's pretty long for a placebo controlled trial. <clears throat> trial and I don't think you'd be uh, easy, it would be easy to uh, get patients uh, attracted to go into clinical trials for six months. And finally, there was no guidance to suggest that patients with and without Hunter lesion should be studied separately, uh, which most people believe at this time. So I'm hoping that the FDA draft guidance will be changed before it becomes a definitive uh, suggestion from FDA. So these are difficult issues to contend with. The end-stage response is BPS best looked at as a syndrome, an end-stage response of the bladder to what may be many causes, a wide range of responses to therapy and natural history, a collection of symptoms. Is Hunter lesion best looked at as a disease, clinically indistinguishable from BPS, but does not evolve from BPS, has a distinct appearance, histology, and response to many therapies. And then the question, should BPS and IC be differentiated in all pharma trials? Well, viewed as one entity, we have failed to find convincing responses to a variety of attempted therapies and decades of trials. The use of local cystoscopy makes differentiation practical and inexpensive, and the guidelines should ultimately reflect this change in thinking. Now let's go to conservative and oral therapy. Oral therapy. And the keystone in what I'm going to say what, and that will follow is, are these points. Half of all ICBPS patients may exhibit symptom improvement with time with or without regular follow-up and receiving a new treatment. Symptom duration is associated with more severe symptoms only in limited populations. Symptom duration is not associated with chronic overlapping pain conditions or mental health comorbidities. And to the extent we can prevent catastrophizing, we can expect less 
long-term pain symptoms. So if we agree to those uh, comments and findings of the recent literature, we can say that one should begin with more conservative therapies, reserving more aggressive therapies for inadequate control of symptoms. Surgery other than fulguration of a Hunter lesion should be reserved for end stage, small fibrotic bladders or when more conservative measures have been exhausted and quality of life is poor. Initially, you wanna review normal bladder function, the ICBPS knowledge base, the risks and burdens of available treatments and the need to try multiple therapies over time. Behavioral modification with diet, fluid intake, exercise, warm tub baths, over-the-counter medicines, patient organizations, websites that are helpful, stress management techniques are all very important initially. I recommend for my patients trying calcium carbonate for flares, that's Tums. I also recommend trying Prelief, which is calcium glycerol phosphate and magnesium stearate, managing fluid intake, avoiding foods or beverages that trigger symptoms, and uh, generally not panicking over this diagnosis. Quercetin is a plant pigment that's been shown to be effective in some patients, uh, never in a giant placebo-controlled trial, but it's still something that's worth trying. We use it in chronic pelvic pain syndrome, non-bacterial prostatitis, and also in bladder pain syndrome. And I think it buys you time for the disease natural history to help as time moves on and patients often will get better on their own. In addition, micronized palmitol ethanolamide polydactin or PEA is available over the counter, just like quercetin is. It has a protective role in a rat model of cytoxan cystitis and has been shown in a couple of recent studies in Italy to be effective, uh, taken over the counter twice daily for three months and then daily for three months. And it's something that's worth trying, easily available. Pelvic floor physical therapy was the one uh, benefit to come out of the 10 year look for search for a magic bullet by the NIH. Maneuvers that resolve pelvic abdominal and or hip muscular trigger points are very helpful and is as useful as any oral medication for bladder pain syndrome if you have a trained physical therapist. Finally, we're gonna talk about oral medications, amitriptyline, hydroxyzine, and pentosan polysulfate. <clears throat> they can either be used before or after trials with intravesical therapy that Dr. Lofash will discuss in a moment. And we'll concentrate on uh, oral pentosan polysulfate, antihistamines, and oral amitriptyline, which all have different mechanisms of action. I first used amitriptyline in 1987 after I had a patient who had severe depression, was treated by her uh, psychiatrist with amitriptyline for depression and her IC symptoms improved dramatically. Arndt van Ophoven in Germany did a placebo controlled randomized trial showing benefit in 2004. And he did a follow-up trial showing a lack of tachyphylaxis and the fact that once you're on this medication, it can help you for months and years in many cases. How does it work? Well, it increases serotonin and norepinephrine in a specific ratio that potentiates the effect of endorphins. It's a beta-3 agonist, so it can, can increase bladder capacity. It has anticholinergic and sedative effects, helps people sleep, and antihistaminic anti effects stabilizing mast cells more than any other tricyclic antidepressant. In the NIDDK trial, in a subgroup of 207 patients who were able to achieve a drug dose of 50 milligrams, they had a 66% response rate compared to 47% placebo response, and it appeared to be successful in patients who could tolerate the drug. So we can conclude that it has long-term safety and efficacy, limited side effects of sedation, dry mouth, constipation, and increased appetite. You have to use caution when using it in the elderly and those with cardiac disease, history of arrhythmia, or at suicide risk, as it has quite a bit of lethality if taken an overdose and can't be reversed. Generally, we recommend starting at 10 milligrams a night and increasing this weekly to a maximum dose of 50 milligrams a night 
or a lower dose if the benefits outweigh the side effects at a lower dose. Pentosan polysulfate is supposed to coat the stomach like Pepto, or rather coat the bladder like Pepto-Bismol coats the stomach. <clears throat> Gag replenishment, urothelial coating decreases histamine release, decreases urothelial, adhe urothelial adherence. It's sold as Elmeron in the United States, the only approved oral medication. Based on these two pivotal trials, these trials had a very low bar, 25% global improvement, and placebo in these two trials was incredibly low at less than 15%. The only objective improvement noted in these two pivotal trials was a 20 cc increase in bladder capacity under sedation. <clears throat> Otherwise, there was no objective improvement seen in any of the parameters studied, but it did meet the endpoint, which was 25% global improvement. It can take up to 11 months to show any benefit. Only 4% is excreted in the urine. Side effects include 4% chance of reversible hair loss and a 10% chance of nausea and diarrhea. In two mandated phase four FDA trials, to check on this because the initial trial was kind of uh, sketchy in terms of the results, they did a dose escalation looking at three cohorts for six months each one on 300, the other on 600, and the third on 900 milligrams daily, and there was no dose response. While side effects increased with dosage, efficacy did not. So then they did another phase four trial, down dosing the drug, 300 milligrams for six months versus 100 milligrams for six months versus placebo, and they had a very low bar for success, 30% reduction in the O'Leary SAMP symptom index, from baseline to week 24, and there was no difference in any of the three groups. And the study was uh, stopped uh, early because of this. Now, recently, a new side effect has been uncovered of pentosan polysulfate by ophthalmologists in Emory, pigmentary maculopathy. They had 36 female patients who were on the drug and 16% developed the side effect, which uh, is, symptom, is symptomatic with difficulty reading and prolonged dark adaptation. Since then, there have been several other papers, and now numerous lawsuits are uh, in uh, being used in terms of trying to get money back from the company for this side effect. Uh, what I would say is, does the benefit of PPS, which can be rather marginal, outweigh this potential risk? Uh, along with the expense of the drug itself. And anyone who does, who is on this drug for a prolonged period of time, uh, usually more than two or three years, should be seen by an ophthalmologist to be sure that this uh, problem isn't developing. Finally, uh, hydroxyzine has never been shown in a placebo controlled trial to be a benefit. However, it is inexpensive. Its main side effect is sedation, so it can help people sleep. It's an anxiolytic, and uh, it was popularized by Theo Harides in the 1990s, 1980s, and it's worth trying in patients, uh, especially those uh, who uh, complain of uh, allerg allergic type symptoms. Recently, there was a paper from China showing sildenafil in low dose, 25 milligrams daily, uh, could be effective. In this study, they had 24 patients on sildenafil, 24 on placebo, and they found uh, benefits in virtually all the parameters that they looked at, including here the O'Leary SANT symptom index and uh, problem index. So this looks like something you could try. In the latest AUA, <clears throat> there is a small uh, study that was accepted uh, in the poster session showing a similar benefit with low dose to dalafil. So these drugs are safe and may be worth a short trial in selected patients, but the efficacy is unproven and they are quite expensive. Cy cyclosporin A is useful as a fifth line treatment in patients with Hunter lesion disease who have not uh, had effective uh, symptom control from less uh, invasive uh, procedures. I would suggest cyclosporin A when the next step is urinary diversion for a Hunter lesion patient. 
It's worth trying and has about an 80% success rate. Side effects include uh, kidney uh, problems, hypertension, and a low risk of lymphoma. And patients have to be aware of the side effects and they have to be aware that if the drug is stopped, usually the symptoms will come back within several months. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to turn the uh, talks over now to Dr. Lovash. Sander? Yes, I'm here. If you can turn your camera on or your uh, video on. It's, it's on, yes. Good afternoon. I tried to get my next slide. Okay, now I will speak on, on these topics. I start immediately because the time is quite limited. So first, I would say a few uh, sentences on epidemiology of this disease. Uh, I have to declare my conflict of interest. Uh, I am founder and, and medical director of Neurosystem. This is a tiny uh, company dealing with different uh, topics in, in the social societies. Uh, but uh, let's go further. Uh, if we would like to define what clinical epidemiology is, uh, we can say epidemiology is the study and analysis of the distribution, patterns, and determinants of health and disease conditions in defined populations. Why are epi epidemiological studies important? It is a cornerstone of public health and shapes policy decisions and evidence-based practice by identifying risk factors for disease and targets for preventive health care. This is the definition of Wikipedia, but, but it's very useful to uh, speak on it first. I show you now a graph. This shows the estimated prevalence of IC patients uh, in female patients uh, based on clinical studies performed in the last 25 years. And don't look at the uh, results, at the numbers, but you immediately see that the estimated uh, number of patients vary absolutely between different studies, independently from the time when the study was performed. Why? We are looking for that. Uh, I just show you two nice studies uh, the first, uh, which I presenting to you, was uh, published in 2011. Uh, it was the Rice study where the female patients were asked on phone interviews. Uh, it was therefore a population-based study. And the definition of uh, interstitial cystitis was twofold. On one side, there was a high sensitivity of case definition. And if they use the high sensitivity definition, then they found a high number, 6.5% of the population uh, could uh, have the interstitial cystitis. Whereas if using the high specificity definition, then the number was much lower naturally. Uh, the conclusion was from the study that uh, the results proved that ICVPS are underdiagnosed in women. Two days, days later, a very similar study was performed uh, uh, regarding male IC patients, also a population-based study where 6,000 men were uh, interviewed by phone, and they also used the high sensitivity and the high specificity, specificity definition and the result was similar, quite high by the high sensitivity definition and quite low if they use this high specificity definition. But according to this definition, uh, they could uh, conclude that the prevalence of ICBPS in men approaches that of women, thus this condition may be highly underdiagnosed in the male population. 
The summary of prevalence studies shows that the wide variety of results can be due to lack of definitive diagnostic investigations, different definitions for diagnosing ICBPS, and the inaccurate sampling methodologies. The prevalence was much higher for both genders than thought previously. Female to male ratio decreased to 5 to 1, as previously we, we thought it is 10 to 1. So this is a great difference. ICBPS still significantly underdiagnosed and mostly in males. The prevalence does not differ among races. It is proven by several studies. So uh, the number of the patients can differ because the diagnosing rate differs, but the prevalence is approximately the same in different parts of the world. Well, about the pathology and the etiology of, the, uh, of this disease, there are many questions. Which one can be the real cause of this disease? Or not just that maybe not just one, maybe a combination of a few of these, or maybe all of them. According and based to many clinical trials and basic research, uh, we can set the present concept of pathophysiology, uh, that it evolves sequentially by urethral injury as a first step. It can be caused by UTI, surgical trauma, chronic overdistension, but also radiation therapy or intravesical chemotherapy could come into consideration. This causes suburothelial inflammation. And this inflammation is a chronic inflammation with cell infiltration in the suburothelium. And this leads to increased inflammatory reactions. Uh, also in the sensory efferents, dorsal horn ganglia and corresponding spinal cords. And this is an upregulation of the sensory side. Uh, if this insult does not continue, we can stop it, then the inflammation resolves and the patients may have symptom relief after symptomatic treatment too. Here I show a very nice summary taken from Campbell's Walsh uh, urology uh, about the etiopathology of ICBPS. The first problem is the bladder insult. Here you see many causes can lead to it. It damages the bladder urothelium, epithelium, and then the epithelium becomes leaky and the urine constituents First of all, potassium, but also other salt can irritate uh, the interstitium getting into it. If you go further, we can see that this leakage uh, activates mast cells and histamine release will uh, be the result. And this histamine uh, triggers immunologic allergic responses and also the C fiber activation and all these uh, symptoms which are, and, uh, I have mentioned already. And this leads to a progressive bladder injury. And what is quite characteristic for interstitial cystitis is that this progressive bladder injury makes a positive feedback on the leakage. And this is the cause of a vicious circle. And this vicious circle uh, originates uh, into a progressive disease. And our goal at the therapy is that we should be able to rewind this vicious circle. And this way, the symptoms can be reduced or the whole uh, pro process can be uh, reversed. The next topic would be the intravesical drug therapy. The oral therapy was mentioned already by Professor Hanno. Now I try to sum up the, some thoughts about the, uh, the intravesical therapy. There, there are challenges regarding this therapy form. Uh, the action of the medication is just a short lasting, a short duration. 
into inside the bladder because uh, the patients urinate uh, it out. Lack of permeability of the urethelium, lack of bladder intake of the drugs. But on the other side, there are a high local drug concentration at the local therapy, which is very important because on the surface of the bladder, we need a high concentration of these agents. Low bladder, uh, blood level, and therefore no systemic side effects. No efficacy reduction due to metabolism, as in the uh, systemic uh, treatment forms. What agents can be used? Well, in the United States, dimethyl sulfox, DMSO, lidocaine and heparinoids are registered and mostly used. The so-called ganglia replenishment by gug, uh, uh, ganglia compounds are mostly used in Europe and in other parts of the world. Dimethyl sulfox is one of the uh, oldest uh, medication we use. Um, the general effect is vehicle for topical application of pharmaceuticals, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect, and topical analgesic. In the urology, we uh, use the advantage, especially the inhibiting effect on mast cells, that it reduces the inflammation, it relaxes the um, detrusal muscle, stimulates nitric oxide release. Side effect uh, is the well known garlic breath odor for two days after installation and pain on installation and the catheter irritation. DMSO versus placebo. This was a nice study performed already a long uh, time ago in 1988. 33 patients were randomized uh, and looked if DMSO or placebo uh, is more effective. And the result was quite convincing. Objective improvement could be shown 93% versus 35, and also subjective improvement 53% versus 13. Another study recently uh, show, uh, looked how HANA uh, lesions, HANA lesion or HANA type interstitial cystitis after hydrotestension and fibrillation react on additional maintenance DMSO therapy. And they found that it prolongs the recurrence-free time significantly. Lidocaine. It's it, uh, uh, well-known anesthetics for bladder afferent nerves causing reduction in urinary tract pain. Uh, there was a nice study uh, performed in 2001 where more than 100 patients were treated with intravesical alkalized uh, lidocaine for five days. And they found that the uh, treatment group with this showed three times more uh, uh, patient uh, observed improvement uh, at the, uh, uh, the global um, response assessment. Uh, for 10 days than the placebo group. It is a quite astonishing result because local anesthetics uh, is uh, usually uh, effective just for a few hours, not for 10 days. Heparin plus alkalized lidocaine. This is a well-known treatment form also accepted in America. It was also uh, patented by Parsons. Uh, that heparin and buffered lidocaine were given for 12 weeks weekly at 32 patients. And the final result showed slightly improved or better, uh, slightly better in global response assessment. But uh, if we look in details, we, we see that during the treatment already after the fourth installation, 60% reported as effective. After the 12th installation, already approximately or around 80% patients uh, were happy with it. And even six months after the uh, finishing the installation, uh, a, a significant portion, approximately 17% of patients, uh, did better than previously. 
The local gag layer replenishment uh, gives the known uh, gag layer compounds, uh, chondroitin sulfate, hyaluronic acid, and heparinoid compounds uh, in a cocktail or in a mixture. But pentazam polysulfate solution, which was mentioned already by Professor Hanno, uh, was also tried in limited clinical trials. And these have no systemic side effects if it's given intravesically. And it, it is basically not a compound of GAG layer, but it uh, may work as a precursor for the synthesis, synthesis of these uh, molecules. The combination of GAG layer compounds promises high res higher response rate as any of these, any monotherapy of these agents. Uh, mostly, therefore, we use mixture of bladder cocktails. Different compounds uh, are used in the US or in uh, Europe. The intravesical ganglia installations were very critically observed in a nice study performed by Professor Madersbacher. Uh, uh, he looked uh, how commonly uh, these are used in Europe, and they found that it was never approved uh, by the FDA in USA. The hyaluronic acid, independently of the dosage, uh, showed fa uh, failure in large trials to show efficacy. Chondroitin sulfate uh, failed large phase 2b efficacy trial. And the heparin and pentazine polysulfate never studied in large randomized clinical trials. Therefore, his suggestion was that large-scale uh, randomized clinical trials are urgently needed. The hyaluronic acid and chondroitin sulfate alone in, or in combination are uh, uh, in many clinical trials uh, uh, used, but these trials were with limited evidence level, but they showed reused pain and frequency growing bladder capacity and improved quality of life. Here is a list of such studies. I know you cannot read it, but it uh, should demonstrate that there are many, many studies uh, with limited evidence level showing some uh, evidence of uh, uh, good effect. Now, after this, uh, I was asked to sum up the European approach and to speak a, a few words about new ideas. I have to state immediately that about European approach, I just can make dark remarks. That's why my slide is also so dark. Because plant extracts are traditionally more accepted in Europe than any other medications. Very few therapists are specialized in ICBPS, too few. There is a low interest in research mostly among young urologists. There is a complete ignorance of this disease amongst gynecologists and GPs. There is no standardization of diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. Everybody can do what they want. No unified documentation and follow-up system is available. No reimbursement in many countries, which makes the treatment different, difficult and physician-initiated clinical trials are very sporadic. That's why I sum up the actual management, not as a, a generally accepted European method, but as we use it in Hungary, in Central Europe nowadays. Uh, the diagnosis uh, is very similar what uh, Professor Hanno mentioned. Uh, the symptoms, we, we try to quantify uh, all symptoms. That's why we use questionnaires, only resend the pain urgency frequency questionnaire, and the special questionnaire for pain level, not just the, the visual analog scale we use. And we also uh, invented and, and uh, use regularly a depression level questionnaire, the Bex depression inventory for uh, patients at the beginning of the diagnosis. And if we find a high level of depression, then we immediately send the patient to the psychologist. We want to prevent uh, those cases where the IC patients are so depressed that they 
uh, can do a suicide. The medical history is, as usually, uh, the exclusion of confusable diseases is also, as in America, maybe uh, this means uh, some difference that we do not perform biopsies anymore, just in very, very selected rare cases, because urine cytology is a less invasive and easy to perform uh, um, examination, and the sensitivity is higher. Uh, than uh, the biopsy. The quantitative measurement of gug layer integrity, that would be optimal. To know quantitatively how the gug layer, is it sufficient or not? This could determine further examinations and also treatment strategy. Is there such a, a quantitative measurements possibility? Uh, very briefly, I sum up the available tests to measure gug layer condition. Potassium sensitivity test from Parsons is well known, but it, it is painful. It is an invasive method through catheterization, and it, it just says if the patient has yes or no the, uh, this disease. So it is non-quantitative. Uh, Daha and Riedel modified this uh, potassium sensitivity test uh, and uh, they instill a less concentrated salt solution. Therefore, the pain uh, is less. It is still invasive because uh, it's performed through catheter, but it gives a quantitative result. Uh, we can not just say yes or no, we also know if it's a, a slight uh, beginning phase or it, a, a more advanced stage of the disease. The lidocaine anesthetic test from Taneja, uh, who suggested to fill up the bladder with lidocaine instead of irritating the bladder with a painful salt solution, uh, results in a painless study to catheter, so it is invasive and gives no quantitative result. Whereas the gug layer integrity the test, which we use since years, it is a completely painless, non-invasive uh, test, which gives a quantitative result. I will show you later. Uh, in the, using this test, uh, uh, this is based on data of a two days special avoiding diary. On the first day, the patients must have a concentrated urine, on the second day, a diluted urine. We use the patient's own urine as a salt solution. We don't have to instill salt solution into the bladder. Urine is a salt solution. And we uh, the patients measure every uh, uh, voided volume and then calculate from this the uh, mean daytime uh, voided volume. And then we compare the two days mean voided volume. How we do that, I show you in this graph. Uh, we can uh, uh, look here the day time mean volumes, which is calculated. And here uh, we show how much the uh, total urine volume was. This uh, corresponds to the uh, concentration of the urine. On the first day, the patient drinks just a limited amount will have a concentrated urine. On the second day, uh, he, she has to drink a lot, a diluted urine. And here you see, if the patient has a healthy gug layer, or it's not an IC patient, then the, uh, concentra the concentrated and the diluted volume is the same. If there is already a moderated uh, gug layer insufficiency, then the uh, the, uh, uh, the volume of the diluted uh, vol uh, urine is some higher than uh, the uh, concentrated. And if it is more expressed, then the difference is even more bigger. We can measure the difference in uh, percent. So this, is, uh, this makes us uh, possible to, to measure the uh, situation, the status of the gag layer by uh, a, a number. The only exclusion uh, is the constricted end stage bladder. It is non elastic. It is not, uh, this test is not to be used in end stage 
kidney uh, bladders. This test is non-invasive, objective, quantitative, inexpensive. It's repeatable anytime, so on demand. Therefore, it's very uh, good, uh, usable for follow-up of patients. And uh, therefore, and also as it is non-invasive and, and not painful, the patient's compliance is high. Here I show you very briefly a flowchart how we use the ganglier integrity. The ganglier test is used also for diagnosis. If it's, uh, uh, it shows a high difference, then it's, it proves that the patient has mainly a ganglier insufficiency, which could turn later into uh, interstitial cystitis. But uh, we can differentiate between slight forms or negative tests, like here you see, or a more advanced uh, form and a very expressed uh, ganglier test. It, this defines us what to do. In these uh, cases, we are giving oral treatment and look uh, very uh, thoroughly at the patient, how she is doing. If it's uh, more expressed, then we give a ganglier installation and we add naturally also the oral treatment to it. If it's uh, very uh, expressed, then we usually make, uh, there, there is a Hanel ulcer, and then we make a uh, distension and the coagulation, and maybe later, if necessary, we can add antidepressants and antihistamine. The intravesical installation therapy is used in our practice on the contrary to AO guideline uh, as the first treatment uh, because we want to use the least invasive and most efficacious treatment. Uh, this is the intravesical GUG layer replenishment, replenishment installation therapy. Just three questions must be answered. What, how, and when to use. What we use? Uh, we use weather cocktails and the installation is always performed in two steps because a single mixture of these compounds may inhibit the action of some compounds. Therefore, the first portion is lidocaine, buffered lidocaine, as you know from, from Parsons, this is more effective, and we add some anti-inflammatory drug uh, steroid to it. Then we are waiting three minutes. It's very important because the lidocaine should, uh, be, uh, should become effective, and also the, uh, the steroids can, uh, can glue on the surface of the bladder. Then we give the second portion, which are the ganglia compounds, heparin, hyaluronic acid, and chondritin sulfate. If necessary, we can also give some uh, buffer to it to reach a, a pH 7 level. Both doses are instilled by the catheter-free installation method. What does it mean? We, we invented a tiny adapter for syringes. Here you see it's, uh, it fits on the Lure Lock syringe and also on the Lure Slip uh, syringe. This tiny uh, nose part goes, passes into the orifice and then this uh, uh, elastic uh, color, isolating color, uh, fits over the surface of the surrounding tissues at the orifice, and this makes the installation, which we perform by flowing the liquid through the urethra into the bladder, it makes drop free. Uh, here you see how elastic this color is, and we use it both in female and in male patients, the same uh, uh, adapter. Uh, throughout the years, we uh, performed over 3,500 installations, so we gained a lot of experience. And based on this experience, we can say that the simultaneous treatment of bladder and urethra and mucosa can be performed just this way. And many patients, not just bladder pain have, but also have urethral pain, so this is an advantage. There is no need of catheterization for installation, no mechanical lesion of the urethral mucosa. It is pain-free, quick, and a simple procedure. When? 
we we use the the same uh, uh, protocol as in many studies first weekly then biweekly and then what how we continue decides uh, the individually tailored frequency can be defined by uh, by the uh, control of the patient's condition and this uh, is performed by uh, the regular input of patients from patients their data their questionnaire and their uh, urinary diary data the long-term follow-up is indispensable in all chronic diseases the continuous observation of patients um, is uh, very uh, essential to enable individual, individually tailored optimal maintenance therapy. Regular data collection over the internet for monitoring is an easy, inexpensive, and patient-friendly solution. An internet-based follow-up system is the best tool to fulfill all these requirements. Uh, this is a home site which was uh, performed or produced for patients here the patient can uh, register and log in and sends their data the questionnaires and uh, urinary diary data regularly into the central database and from these data uh, uh, there is an automatically generated curve which can be seen by the patient and by the doctors also the doctor also log in and look into this data, uh, central database. I just show you a few curves how it looks. All the recent curves, curve. Uh, before the installation, this uh, score was high. During the course of the treatment, run low. Uh, get uh, the patient gets for two uh, years completely symptom free. If you see such a curve, then you can be sure this. Uh, patient has a very good uh, condition. Here you see, here we started the installation therapy and the main voided volume was measured and here uh, uh, shown in this graph. And you see that during the course of the treatment for two years, there is a continuous improvement, proving that the inflammation uh, inside the bladder wall disappears just uh, very slowly it uh, takes approximately two years. Uh, here, uh, another curve which shows the, the two days voiding diary. It was quite high, the difference at the beginning. Then after uh, the treatment, it runs low. Uh, uh, lower than 130 uh, is normal, and then slowly rises. This is a normal uh, situation after treatment. Here you see that the only recent uh, uh, points reduced after the initiating the installation therapy but we could not reach a good result but after hydrodistension and coagulation as it was a uh, hanalation uh, we we got a very very good result finally i sh should mention a, a clinical pilot study um, which was performed to test the our new aiding device uh, which was produced for self-installation of female patients. Uh, this uh, device combines the advantages of the self-installation and also the adapter. So catheter-free installation can be performed by the patients themselves. 15 patients learned to use it very properly. There were no injury, no infection or any other complications. All patients declared to keep on using this device, and all patients would recommend it to use for other patients. Here you see the advantages. It can be used by a single hand used, and here you see that there is a tiny, tiny camera, video camera, which shows the, uh, the tip of the adapter, and here on this display, the patient can control this, the movement. Here is a, a real, a picture made by the built-in camera as the patient get closer and closer the, to the orifice and can control the whole installation for herself. Uh, there's a clear visualization, no need of catheterization, completely pain-free, 
It reduces the expenses enormously because the patient can do it at home, doesn't go to travel uh, to the doctor, and it, also the medical care costs uh, can be left. And individually tailored treatment frequency can be performed by using this. Finally, a sentence, very important. Personally optimized cocktails given in individually tailored frequency and dosage as a self-installation improves efficacy of the treatment and minimizes the treatment expenses. Therefore, this method should be considered as the future of ICBPS maintenance therapy. I am convinced this will be the future. Thank you. Now, I try to uh, give it further for Professor Clements. Hi. Thanks, Sander. Um, just looking to advance my slide here. So my first uh, talk is related to neuromodulation, uh, botulinum toxin, and surgery. These are all uh, options um, for treatment listed in the AUA guidelines. Uh, so we'll start with sacral nerve stimulation, uh, which I think everyone's familiar with. Um, the purpose of this slide is just to show that uh, there actually have not been uh, a lot of recent studies for this uh, technique, which just suggests that the at least the research community has not been as uh, interested in it as perhaps some other treatments uh, and studies that were done earlier. Uh, it does seem to work uh, for IC. The success rates range from 60 to 80 percent. I think one question that's a bit open-ended is does it help for pain or urinary symptoms? Uh, interestingly, despite that IC is a pain condition, most of the studies have not assessed pain outcomes. The few that did have somewhat equivocal results. Uh, one showed reduction in narcotic use, the other really did not so, show much of a change in pain. So I tell my patients, I, I think it's likely this may help with the urinary symptoms, uh, pain symptoms, uh, harder to, to know. Um, I think it's very clear that compared to our standard OAB patients, when we utilize this uh, technique in IC patients, the success rates are a bit lower, there's higher reoperation rates and more reprogramming requirements. Uh, and for that reason, we have investigated a number of other uh, techniques, including bilateral or multiple leads. Uh, what we do um, at University of Michigan, one of my partners, Priyanka Gupta, uh, does uh, pedendal nerve stimulation. Uh, the nice thing about that is you can um, code for sacral nerve stimulation modifier, so there is an existing code you can use for it, uh, and it can patients. And here are just some images that show um, how the lead is placed. The first uh, part of this is to do a pedendal nerve block, and those who uh, then go on to have the lead placed. Now, skipping to botulinum toxin, this is one of the standard slides understanding of how it works for muscle paralysis. But the interesting thing is, it seems to also help for pain. And no one, I think it's fair to say, really understands why that is the case, but it helps migraines and trigeminal neuralgia and other pain conditions. And so it's been uh, somewhat adopted for use for, for IC. And here we show in uh, comparison to the in the recent number of years, uh, there's been quite uh, a few studies uh, that have uh, examined the use of, of botulinum toxin for IC. So it's gotten the interest of, of investigators. Uh, and a couple of things with technique. This is similar to OAB in the sense that you should use a 100 unit dose. Uh, using a higher dose doesn't seem to work any better and causes a higher risk of retention. And also whether you inject it into the trigone or bladder body does not seem to matter. So that's uh, similar to OAB. Um, similar to sacral nerve stimulation, uh, botulinum toxin does work. Uh, the results show a response rate anywhere from 50 to 80%. It has about a six month duration, so similar to OAB in that sense. As you might expect, uh, there's a little higher risk of complications, most commonly dysuria, uh, those complications do not seem to uh, change or increase with multiple doses, so it's just a, a constant thing there. 
Uh, and with the 100 unit dose the risk of urinary retention, which of course we really want to avoid in these patients, that risk is, is very, very low, which is reassuring. What about surgery? Uh, so this um, is listed as an option in the guidelines. Um, I have managed a few patients who have had augments um, and they've done okay. I have never done an augment myself in an IC patient, I think more related to um, uh, diversions. And I view kind of three patient types. So there's, um, there's those who kind of have an end stage bladder. That's about 35% of the patients. These are patients who just have a uh, painful, infected, bleeding, small uh, bladder that just does not do anything it's supposed to do. These patients typically have very severe incontinence uh, and they do quite well with the diversion. Usually they're elderly and many of these folks wake up the day after surgery and say, wow, that's the first time I've slept through the night in years and years. And so these patients uh, do, do quite well. They generally are pretty elderly, as I said. Um, then about 10% are the ones who come to the office and basically can explain how to do the surgery to me. Um, and they typically, the last few I've had, want an Indiana pouch, and they tell me they want their urethra removed too because they've read that that can have a, a persistent pain issue, et cetera. And they also tend to do well. They have a good understanding of, of what they're getting into. And then, of course, the ones that are more difficult are the 55% or so that uh, have chronic pain, narcotic use, often heavy smokers, often not coping well with their situation. Um, and I often find, first of all, these folks are just not good surgical candidates, many of them just to begin with. Um, many of them actually have not um, tried treatments that we could offer to them. Um, and then there are some where eventually we do get around to surgery and, and they, that can be a bit of an adventure in the post-op period and long-term, but some of them can do well. I don't uh, reject these folks out of hand, but I usually think uh, quite seriously about it and and uh, look at other options is, is my you know, general approach. Uh, when we do a cystectomy, this is just a, a technique we wrote up uh, for a simple cystectomy. We use the ligature, we bivalve the bladder, amputate the, uh, the wings on each side, uh, and then uh, use the bovi turned up high and basically bovi off the residual mucosa. Uh, and then there's usually a, just a, a small um, urethral remnant that's left, uh, which we sometimes will over sew, not always. It takes about 30 minutes to do with very minimal blood loss, removes the mucosa, which is the part that uh, generally is, is going to cause trouble for them in the future and works well. So the next topic is confounding and associated dis disorders. <clears throat> so confounding disorders are things that may mimic IC. Uh, and associated disorders are uh, things that associate with IC and make the uh, situation more complex. So in terms of confounding disorders, I think the one we always worry about is bladder cancer. And there's at least one study that suggested about 1% of patients who were referred with a diagnosis of IC was found to have cancer. It is something to be um, aware of and to uh, rule out. Um, and if a patient hasn't had a, a cystoscopy recently, it's something to especially if they have a hematuria, et cetera. Having said that, IC is certainly not considered to be a pre-malignant diagnosis or have a higher risk of bladder cancer. Uh, a somewhat newer concept is ketamine cystitis, um, and this uh, is an anesthetic agent that has uh, been co-opted as a recreational drug. Uh, I have talked with uh, colleagues in some bigger cities where they've seen this, uh, it apparently not, has not taken off in the Midwest because I've not ever seen it. It's been written up mostly in Asian countries if you look at the literature. So the, as I understand it, you stop the drug and hope they get better. And I always say if they don't, then I'm not sure what to do and I would consider sending them to Phil Hanno. And hopefully he uh, has some ideas. Uh, this is just a slide of bladder endometriosis. Um, a fair number of patients with IC carry a diagnosis of endometriosis. Uh, once you look in and see it, it shouldn't really be confusing. This doesn't look like IC. Um, the main advice is, is uh, really think twice before biopsying it because that can be a, quite an adventure if you do because it bleeds. Um, and generally then, you know, these folks usually carry a diagnosis of endometriosis. Uh, many times they require a partial cystectomy, but usually you try to optimize their systemic therapies first. Two other areas that I say are, are somewhat um, 
I guess, confusing or, or confounding. Um, I've seen a fair number of patients who had this weird bladder lesion that was biopsied and then it didn't show cancer. And so they were forgotten about and, and told that, well, you don't have cancer, I can't help you. And I, you know, I think those are patients who probably had a Hunter's lesion to begin with and, and the urologist just thought it was a possible tumor. And I usually ask, well, what happened? You know, did you feel better after? And they say, yeah, after that was biopsied and cauterized, boy, I got so much better for a while. Now my system, uh, symptoms are back. So I think it's just something to be aware of in that uh, situation, uh, be thinking a hunter's lesion, and then that can be a targetable area when they recur. Then the other point is, and I think most people know this, but glomerulations by themselves without any bladder symptoms, that's not IC. I think we really would like there to be an objective measure uh, or a test that we can do, uh, but there isn't. And glomerulations just needs to be part of the whole picture. So I have occasionally seen patients sent to me with a diagnosis of IC because someone saw glomerulations in their bladder and they had absolutely no bladder symptoms. Um, another one to discuss is overactive bladder. This is from a, a paper that Phil co-authored. Um, and I think you have on the right side uh, near the red IC disc bladder pain. So there are some patients that clearly just have bladder pain and that diagnosis could be fairly straightforward. On the other side, you have some patients who feel perfectly fine, except every so often they have sudden urgency and in have incontinence. And that's fairly straightforward. That would be IO overactive bladder. But there's all kinds of arrows here in between these. And what that suggests is that, boy, there is some overlap between what we generally consider the classic OAB and the classic IC. And I don't think anyone has a really good answer to this, but I think the concept that these two are completely separate conditions and can easily be distinguished between each other is not so straightforward. So for instance, we asked this question in a group of women with IC and a group with OAB, and these were all diagnosed by people who um, are well regarded in these fields. And you know, most of them had urgency, so, so that's a common symptom. And then 40% uh, of the ones with OAB said they had urgency due to pain or pressure or discomfort. And so it just raises the question of you know, to what degree is the overlap and, and really can we easily or readily distinguish between these conditions based on symptoms? I'm not So then the associated conditions, the main message here is many women and men with IC also have chronic pain conditions in other parts of the body. And the term we're using is COPC, chronic overlapping pain conditions. You'll see that that is one of those is present in the majority of patients with IC. In addition, many of these folks, as we know, have psychosocial comorbidities that complicate their management. And so this has been uh, recognized, and here's this uh, publication, you know, talking about the chronic overlapping pain conditions. It's really a main focus of the NIH and other agencies and really is a kind of a contemporary concept that people need to be aware of. Uh, why is that? Well, because it matters. The, the patients who have one of these don't do as well. They have poorer quality of life and worse symptoms. And this is um, data from the BAP network. Uh, these different um, curves show you have three different groups. Those who do better are stable or worse over time. And we stratify based on their pain symptoms and their urinary symptoms. And the point is um, patients who have one of these COPCs do worse. They tend to be much more likely in the ones who over a year um, don't do as well. So the conclusions are, you know, IC does remain a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, and, you know, we need to do a focused and individualized evaluation to rule out other causes. Um, second, IC and OAB, unfortunately, have many overlapping features, and we don't really have reliable tests to distinguish them. And the existing data suggests that many and perhaps most patients appear to have symptoms of both. Uh, and thirdly, the patient, in patients with IC, the identification of these chronic overlapping pain conditions appears to provide important prognostic information. So it reinforces the importance of multidisciplinary care. And it raises the question, you know, do these patients with widespread pain have a little different phenotype? And um, you know, could they maybe be treated differently? And um, I'll talk about that a bit more in my next 
uh, talk here related to maps. So um, finally, this is a, a summary of some of the findings we've um, discovered in the MAP network. Um, so uh, Phil introduced this briefly. MAP stands for Multidisciplinary Approach to the Study of Chronic Pelvic Pain. Uh, and this is uh, six sites, which I'll show in the next slide. But one important thing is we're studying both IC and chronic prostatitis. And so to help, uh, I guess, so that we don't have to always say IC and chronic prostatitis, we coined a term called urologic chronic pelvic pain syndrome, or UCPPS, which is simply a term that encompasses both of these conditions. So there are six sites listed here. There's also a data coordinating center and a tissue core. And one important aspect of this is that each of these sites paired up a urology specialist with a non-urology pain specialist in order to work together, um, learn from each other, develop techniques or, or uh, modify techniques that have been used and are useful for um, non-urology pain conditions. We've done two major studies. Um, the first, uh, we followed the patients with UCPPS for 12 months. Uh, they had their normal usual care and they completed questionnaires every two weeks for the year. And they also came in at baseline six months and 12 months for in-depth assessments. So we had those patients, then we had a group of asymptomatic controls who were assessed at baseline at one time point, and also a group of positive controls, those with other pain conditions so we could compare findings across these different groups. We collected a lot of information related to their symptoms and demographics and history. We collected biospecimens. We did neuroimaging and pain testing, which I'll talk about. Um, and then we followed them, as I said, over a year and also connect, collected other information longitudinally uh, listed here. So the first important thing is that uh, we found that pain symptoms and urinary symptoms don't track together. They're different. So what does that mean? You may have a patient who, whose pain gets better over time and their urinary symptoms get worse. It suggests that um, maybe we should look at treatments and how they affect their pain symptoms and their urinary symptoms separately rather than putting them all together. And this gets back to Phil's point about some of the recent FDA requirements that don't necessarily fit with some of the data we have. So, so this suggests we should probably have two separate endpoints, one focusing on pain outcomes and one on urinary outcomes. And so this is some um, curves like I showed earlier. So you've got the pain severity on the left, urinary severity on the right. They track differently over the year, and we have some that got better in pain symptoms, some that got better in urinary symptoms, some that got worse in each of those. And so we can and look to see what correlates with those changes. And we found that widespread pain, patients did worse. Patients with those chronic overlapping pain conditions did worse. Patients with more severe bladder focus symptoms did worse. And patients with psychosocial comorbidities did worse. So suggest that we should at least bear these in mind when we're designing clinical trials in the future. Uh, we did neuroimaging studies and showed not only altered structure, but also altered function in the brains of patients with urologic pain. And, and these types of kind of objective findings really start moving us away from more of a syndrome approach, approach to more of a disease approach. Uh, and the areas where there were abnormalities are associated with bladder sensation, urinary control, and pelvic floor muscle activity. And so it suggests that dysfunction in UCPPS is not confined to the pelvis. And then the question is, how can we use this information clinically? Could it potentially predict treatment response? We will see. Uh, pain testing was done with this device, which puts pressure on the thumb bed, and then the person basically tells us when it starts to get uncomfortable and then eventually when they reach maximum tolerance. And there are curves that can be generated. And basically, we found that uh, the patients in with IC and chronic prostatitis were more sensitive than controls um, and not quite as sensitive as patients with widespread pain. And interestingly, in our patients with UCPPS, if they had worse or, or lower pain sensitivity, they were, had a greater likelihood of improvement 
And they also had more, uh, if they had greater pain sensitivity, more widespread pain. So if the thumb hurt a lot more, um, they tended to not do as well, and they also had more widespread pain. And so this suggests there might be more of a centralized or central phenotype in some of our patients. Uh, that's kind of an objective finding. Uh, and then the third area to highlight was, um, this was a study done at Iowa, um, and they, they were looking at inflammatory response in peripheral blood, white blood cells. So these, these, you know, blood was obtained, the white cells were then separated, and then they um, kind of added a variety of uh, things that stimulate toll-like receptors, TLR2, TLR4, and found that patients with IC had a lot more inflammatory response and that that correlated also with symptom trajectory over time. And so I'll get to this in a minute, but in MAP2, in the next phase, we're extend extending these studies across all studies. MAP2, uh, we just uh, next month are going to finish our follow-up of these patients. We're following them for three years. This is just the UCPPS patients. We've added a few things. So we added a very standardized, uh, detailed pelletor muscle exam. We added some mobile technology data capture. One thing I'll talk about in a second is we were able to do much more neuroimaging and pain testing. In MAP1, we, can only, we only did that once. In MAP2, we're doing it multiple times. We added some microbiome studies, and very importantly in MAP2, we're asking detailed questions about treatment response. So the patients are still receiving regular care, but we're asking them to tell us when their doc or their caregiver is changing their treatment. And then we are having them come in before that treatment change and be phenotyped before and after they start that treatment to see if we can identify certain predictors of treatment response. So it, that would then give us information about uh, what to do for future clinical trials. Uh, and so what we have now is the ability to combine data from various different uh, areas, such as biomarkers and neuroimaging, et cetera, testing and clinical uh, data. Uh, it took a while to get all these things up and running in MAP1. So you can see here at baseline, we only had 13 patients who had all of those things collected. MAP2 will have 374. We do have 374 individual patients who had all of that info. And then if you look at the longitudinal data, again, we had 35 patients uh, who had you know, any visit, had all those um, uh, modalities. And in MAP2, we have over 750. So much, much more data to ask some of the questions that like I just showed. Um, one quick pot of the press thing is uh, the concept of widespread pain. So Phil briefly mentioned that there are some clinical trials that were done by the NIH, and most of them showed really no benefit. And uh, what we were able to do was we got those raw data, and, and it, some of those studies had a questionnaire that asked some questions about pain throughout the body. It's, a, it's called the University of Wisconsin IC Index. So we were able to kind of make up, if you will, or develop a, um, a uh, assessment of widespread pain and see if that mattered. Well, it turns out, um, those with widespread pain had a very positive response to amitriptyline compared to placebo, and those with localized pain only had a very positive response to pentacene polysulfate and hydroxyzine. Now, these are secondary data analyses, but they suggested if, if these studies had accounted for widespread pain, maybe the results would have been a bit different or the message would have been a bit different. And so we have to look at this more in the future, but it's interesting. So to conclude, I'll just say, I think well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I think we'll soon be able to stratify patients into clinically meaningful subgroups that will yield better designed clinical trials, more consistent management strategies, and improved patient outcomes. And for those who have uh, would like more info, um, this is a paper that was published not long ago in Nature Reviews Urology, uh, which summarizes uh, in much more detail many of the points I made. And with that, I will turn it back over to Phil. Thank you very much, Clinton. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the AUA's program. We're going to get to the questions in just a moment. Course evaluations and CME credit will be administered electronically on AUA University immediately following the webinar. As the AUA continues to develop virtual education that meets your needs, we especially welcome your feedback regarding the content speakers and format following this program.
Upon completion of this activity, you will need a keyword to access the course evaluation, <clears throat> CME credit claim and certificate. The keyword for this activity is phenotype. We hope you can join us for the short Q&A and we'll start that right now. And um, the first uh, question, is it still useful to perform potassium sensitivity testing when we are making a diagnosis? And I would just uh, answer that and say, there's really no data that shows that the potassium sensitivity test is worthwhile. And in fact, there is data to suggest that even in patients who have a positive potassium test, there's no difference in their response to Elmron. It does not change what you do. And uh, it's it can flare the disease and cause all sorts of problems. So uh, I would I would say no. Um, Sandor, do you have any comment on that? Can you have to turn on your microphone? I can't hear you. Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, I also would say no because the Parsons test is painful test an invasive test and the result uh, is just non-quantitative so uh, uh, it's not uh, not not uh, recommended second question uh, cyclospore and how is it initially dosed and adjusted for ic patients i would say this if you're going to use cyclosporin you should look up the literature before you do generally it's 1.5, it's generally two to three milligrams per kilogram in two divided doses. And you have to measure cyclosporin levels and you want them to be between 100 and 200. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of things to look out for and a lot of blood tests that you need to get before you start cyclosporin. But it's, it's not hard, it's just time consuming and uh, it can be a very beneficial treatment. But you have to keep a close eye on those patients. Uh, next is a question for uh, Quentin. What is your take on the new PCR and other diagnostic tests to identify pathogens in urine that are not picked up on standard cultures? What test do you use? Is this leading to an overuse of antibiotics? Um, well, those usually are at least brought up in the setting of possible UTIs. I, I think that the fact is you know, when you, you're looking for um, uh, ribosomal, you know, RNA from bacteria. And, you know, you don't, the question is, are, are those bacteria even alive? I mean, those could, it could be dead. I, and so I think the fact is we don't really know um, the significance of that. It's kind of interesting finding that some patients who have maybe IC or overactive bladder have a little different microbiome or et cetera. But certainly my concern is along the lines of, I think the person who wrote the question, about um, having a message that we just need to give more antibiotics. I don't think that is the correct answer at all. And at this point, I don't use those tests um, uh, at all and because I, I haven't, I don't see the clinical utility at this point and I certainly don't um, advocate using more antibiotics to treat uh, bacteria that may be dead. Okay, I have a question for Sandor. Why is it more common in European populations than in Americans to see hunter lesion? Do you think there's any genetic, dietary, or lifestyle predisposition? I don't know uh, such a uh, data. Uh, if it would be uh, more frequent in European countries, maybe in some countries where uh, cystoscopy is performed more frequently, then they find more uh, hana lesions in other countries cystoscopy does not belong to to a routine examinations at each uh, ic patients so they find them less that's that's my answer okay can, sandra can you clarify um what cocktail you're using to treat patients yes yeah, sure what's As your go-to cocktail I think I showed uh, the composition in two steps. First, lidocaine and steroid, buffered lidocaine and steroid, then wait three minutes. Then I give a mixture of heparin, uh, chondroitin sulfate, and hyaluronic acid. And this, uh, the pH value is also set 
up to uh, seven to be neutral, not to irritate the bladder. This is Did you have, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sander, have you published your uh, information on the gag layer integrity test? Not yet. I uh, reported it in ESSIC meeting uh, in um, Philadelphia a few years ago, and uh, we are going to publish it, yes. Quentin, any comments on the recent reports of vision problems in patients on Elmeron? Um, well, yeah, so I, uh, uh, Phil, you covered that some in your talk, but I think it's very concerning. I think that, um, you know, it's probably moved from a single one site, small finding that uh, was you know hard to know what to make of it. Now we see multiple uh, reports. So I certainly something that I discuss with every patient who I prescribe. And uh, when I see people back uh, who are taking it, I mention it to them. Um, and I think the problem is, you know, what we're in that gray area where, you know, it's a concern. So what do you do? Well, I think probably everyone who's on the drug might want to see an ophthalmologist and be screened. I suppose that's the, the safe way to do it. Um, and what I find interesting is the FDA has not come out with a, a warning um, that I know of, which is, I think, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I don't know what that means. Uh, perhaps they are not um, swayed by the data. Uh, certainly, I've heard multiple um, and seen on TV multiple attorney um, ads for this. So at least the, the attorneys are aware of it. So I, I think it's something we have to let our patients know about and encourage them to see an ophthalmologist. And of course, what that means is many people choose to stop the drug, uh, which I, you know, I think is appropriate if people are worried about that. Okay, the next question I'll take, do you expect glomerulations to go away in patients using Elmeron? Um, I don't think that's really an issue, whether they go away or not, because I don't think they have any significance, uh, and I don't think they're, they're an endpoint in any treatment. No one is really worried about whether or not they have glomerulations. Um, what is your opinion, I'll give this one to Quentin, in cauterizing the trigone in these patients? It's an old, old therapy for urethral yeah. surgery, I think. Well, so um, I think that the trigone has the uh, highest density of, of nerves. Um, and um, speaking of Botox, you know, I when I took over from Ed McGuire's practice, he had moved to just injecting the trigone with Botox, and those patients did fine. So I learned something from that. I also have done some Engelman Sunberg procedures over the years where you kind of make a vaginal incision to denervate to help with urge incontinence. So those are examples of things I have done to target the trigone. Cauterizing trigone, I think, is something that um, was, I guess, an old technique. I have not adopted it. Um, so I don't think there's any data that I'm aware of that's really compelling to, to adopt that concept. Um, and I think just cauterizing tissues in these patients who um, you know, are pretty prone to having pain is something we need to think about, you know, and, and be concerned about. I totally agree with you. Um, is there, question, is there any role of intradetrusor injection of local anesthetic? I can't imagine that there would be uh, a role for that. I don't think it would um, last very long anyway, but uh, Sander, do you have a comment on that? injecting local directly into the detrusor? No, I, I would not recommend it. Uh, we always would like to uh, give some causal, causal treatment. This means to repair the gag layer. That's why we are giving uh, uh, artificial gag layer, so to say, the gag compounds. And on the other side, uh, the reduce uh, urine's irritative effect by alkalizing the urine, not let, uh, letting it be too acidic. And uh, but also by the diet, we prevent uh, getting irritating agents into the urine. This is what is okay. it. And we'll take one last question for Quentin. Can you comment on bacterial biofilm causing IC? 
Um, I'm not aware of any data from IC that bacterial, you know, biofilms and, you know, uh, colonies like that are involved in the pathophysiology uh, of IC patients. So um, I don't think there's any evidence that ties those two together. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. It's, um, it's been a very good, interesting session from our standpoint. I hope it was helpful to all of you, and I uh, hope you'll join more of these AUA uh, webinars in the future. Thank you.